Hi guys, today I'm going to talk about organic chemistry, and organic chemistry is a field of chemistry that has a lifetime's worth of molecules to study, but we're just going to scratch the surface, and today we're going to talk about the simplest of the organic molecules, and organic chemistry is built around the element of carbon. So there are 118 elements on the periodic table right now that we know of, and there's an entire branch of carbon or a dire branch of chemistry that's all about carbon. And uh, the reason for that is because if we remember our Lewis dot structure for carbon, it has four valence electrons, and these four valence electrons can allow carbon to have any variety of bonding type. And so it can do single bonds, it can share one pair of electrons with four different things, it can do a double bond and share two pairs of electrons with something, it can do a triple bond and share three pairs of electrons, and because of this versatility, carbon really is known as the backbone of life, and organic chemistry really has a lot to do with um, biological um, molecules, or molecules that are of biological significance, and they're all built around the element of carbon. <clears throat> there are literally billions of molecules that can be formed with carbon um, in some way, shape, or form, carbon at the backbone. And the simplest of these organic molecules are called hydrocarbons and alkanes, and we'll get to that in a second, but what I wanted to talk about before that are all the exceptions to the rule here, So, meaning the molecules that contain carbon that aren't considered to be organic. So let's talk about some exceptions first, and then we'll go into hydrocarbons. So when I'm talking about exceptions, I'm talking about things like just solid carbon. So carbon that's in the solid form can be something like graphite, that's the stuff in your pencils. Graphite, um, you can also have solid carbon that is diamond. So the diamond in all of your diamond rings is just solid carbon that's actually tetrahedrally coordinated, whereas graphite has a hexagonal type structure. So these are two allotropes of carbon, which means that they are the same phase. They're both solids, um, but they are different arrangements of the atoms. So just solid carbon, elemental carbon, is not considered an organic molecule. Now another one that's familiar to us is carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide gas, um, which we've talked about in a lot of different contexts and comes up with things like climate change, carbon dioxide, and as well as carbon monoxide, both of these are not considered organic molecules. Part of the reason for that is they were studied prior to the field of organic chemistry coming about, and they also just aren't made in the same way. Um, organic molecules and organic synthesis is kind of a separate thing. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide have different properties. Um, they were just kind of before organic chemistry's time, and we understood things about them before, um, before they came along. So. Um, the, there are more exceptions. Another one is a polyatomic ion, which is called the carbonate ion. The carbonate ion is a polyatomic ion, meaning a group of atoms that together, when they're bonded together, has a charge on it. So um, in this case, the carbonate ion has a negative two charge. That's what that superscript tells me. And um, you find carbonate in a number of different substances, like calcium carbonate, for instance. Calcium carbonate um, is the primary component of things like chalk, or if you look at antacid tablets, or um, things like Maalox, or anything that has like a chalky substance to it, a lot of protein shake kind of things will have calcium carbonate in them. And that's not considered an organic molecule, even though it has carbon in it. So the carbonate itself has a charge it's paired with a metal, that means that this is an ionic compound, and ionic compounds are not considered to be organic. <clears throat> now when we think of organic, we probably think of like overpriced foods and things that don't have pesticides on them, and that's kind of what the term has evolved to mean, but organic chemistry is really all about carbon, and that's a little bit of a different way of thinking about organic as a term than we're used to thinking about it, quite frankly. So let's talk about the simplest molecules here. These things are called hydrocarbons, and they're made up of two elements, 
and it's, you know, aptly named. It's made up of two elements, hydrogen and carbon. They're hydrocarbons. And uh, the simplest of those is methane, CH4. And if you draw the Lewis dot structure of it, again, we said that carbon wants to make four bonds. If those four things that it's attached to are hydrogens, that gives us methane. This is a tetrahedrally coordinated molecule, so it makes that four-sided pyramid. And this is a hydrocarbon. Now, if we look at something to do with this name, we have kind of different rules than we've seen before. If I named this like I would name non-metals paired with non-metals, so covalently bonded compounds like I have here, I would have named this carbon tetrahydride. Carbon tetrahydride, because that's the way that I name uh, molecules that have covalent bonds and are nonmetals with nonmetals. But with naming in organic chemistry, we have an entirely different set of rules. And this set of rules comes from a governing body that is called IUPAC. And IUPAC actually does the other naming rules too, but we usually talk about IUPAC more in organic chemistry. And it stands for the I is international, U is union, for P for pure, and applied is the A, chemistry. International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry, IUPAC. And IUPAC comes up with the rules for nomenclature, which is naming. <clears throat> now, if we go back to our methane here, I'll try to have this at the top. There we go. If we look at methane, it has one carbon and again, organic chemistry is all about carbons. The one carbon gives me the prefix meth. So we can associate the prefix for the name of the hydrocarbon with the number of carbons that are in it. And so for if we're going to make a little chart here, kind of a number of carbons and then the prefix. There are a few of them that I want you to know. I want you to know uh, one through eight. So if I have one carbon, that gives me a prefix of meth. You may recognize meth from things like Breaking Bad, right? Because methamphetamines is something that you've probably heard of. The difference between amphetamine and amphetamine molecule and methamphetamines is uh, the difference of one methyl group or one carbon extra on this structure. And that uh, changes the way that we use it. It changes the way that it is abs absorbed into our bodies, etc. <clears throat> so methane then, the meth part refers to how many carbons there are. The ending A-N-E comes from the fact that this is an alkane, and I'll get into that in just a second. So pardon my reach there. Let's make this table, and then we'll talk about alkanes. So if I have two carbons, the prefix is F. Three is prop. Like propane, that's something that you can get from the gas station, that's stuff that's used in our um, barbecues, etc. Four is but, like butane, butane lighters, for instance, that's a U. <clears throat> Five, now they start to get a little more common. So meth, eth, prop, and but are kind of weird. We don't usually associate those with the numbers, but five gets into more regular. So pent, like pentagon or pentagram, um, then that s signifies five, either five sides of the building or five points of your star or whatever. Six is hex, seven is hept, eight is oct, and oct is, you've seen like octane ratings on your gasoline pump, so if you have 87, 89, 91, those are all the octane ratings, and it has to do with um, the composition of hydrocarbons that are present in your gasoline, and um, and the purity of the sample, and how well it burns, and how clean it burns, and all that good stuff, so that's, um, you know, dialed into whichever type you need for your specific engine. Okay, so here's our prefixes. <clears throat> Now let's talk about the ending there. I said that the ending A-N-E refers to the fact that it's an alkane. Alkanes are the simplest hydrocarbons that all have single bonds. So alkanes are hydrocarbons with single bonds. Okay, so if I see the term propane, which you have, um, anytime that you go to the store or anytime that you go to the gas station and you see signs for propane, then the propane tells you this 
name tells you that there are three carbons in it, that comes from my prefix, and that all of those carbons and hydrogens in that hydrocarbon are all singly bonded, so that A-N-E tells me that. Now I have other options, I can have ene endings, and this means that it's an alkene. That means that I have um, one, at least one double bond. And then Y-N-E as an ending, ein, means that I have an alkyne, and that means that I have at least one triple bond. So I have three different options for my hydrocarbons, which are just made up of hydrogen and carbon. They can have different bonding patterns. Single bonds are giving me alkanes, um, alkenes have at least double, one double bond, alkynes have at least one triple bond, and these endings are gonna correspond to that. So if I had propene instead of propane, that means that I have three carbons and there's at least one double bond in it. If I have propine, then it means there's three carbons and I have at least one triple bond in it, okay? So that um, gives you a lot of information about the structure. And if you know the structure, you know the name, and if you know the name, then you can produce the structure. And that's kind of the nice thing about the rules of IUPAC. Now, just another thing to mention here, because it's gonna become important later. If I have all single bonds in a structure, we say that this is a saturated hydrocarbon. And saturated, just kind of like a saturated solution, means that it's full. I'm full of as many bonds as I possibly can have. I have as many atoms on there as I possibly want. Carbon wants to make four bonds. It wants to be bonded to four atoms. That gives me all single bonds. That means it's saturated. Oops, totally didn't spell that right. Saturated, I gave it too many syllables. <clears throat> And if I have at least one double bond and at least one triple bond, this means that I don't have four atoms that are attached to my carbons, and that makes these guys unsaturated. Spell it right this time. So double bonds, triple bonds are unsaturated hydrocarbons, and single bonds are saturated hydrocarbons. And that'll become important when we talk about things like fats later on, because the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats has to do with the hydrocarbon chains in our lipid molecules, and we'll get into that. Okay, so now as I add my different number of carbons here, let's take butane for instance. Butane has four carbons. The prefix but tells me that I have four carbons. The ending A-N-E means that all of my carbons are bonded singly to each other and to their hydrogens. So that means that the structure of butane looks like this. Okay, that's my molecule. That's my Lewis dot structure. Now at this point, I have all of my carbons in a row. There's nothing really fancy about it. We call this a straight chain alkane, straight chain. So straight chain alkanes means that all of my carbons are in a row. All of my carbons are bonded to um, either one or two other carbons and that's it, okay? I don't have any carbons that are bonded to three or more. Um, there's just a straight chain of them. And there's a couple different ways that we can um, show these because as these molecules get larger and larger, so I only have four carbons here and it almost took up half of my page. If I wanted to do something like octane with eight carbons, then this molecule gets gigantic pretty quickly and it can get larger and larger beyond that. So this is what's called the structural formula, which is one way to represent it, formula. And it's really just the Lewis dot structure. It shows the bonding pattern. <clears throat> so it shows the way that everything is connected to each other. But again, this gets a little bit unwieldy. So uh, there's another way that we can um, condense this down and it's called the condensed formula. Okay, and the condensed formula shows the number of hydrogens and carbons that are there 
but it just shows individual linkages. So it has um, one carbon at the center and however many hydrogens, and it kind of shows that linkages between the carbons. And here's how it works. So for the condensed formula, I take each individual carbon because organic chemistry is all about carbon. And I can translate from my structural formula. Here I have CH3. And that CH3 is connected to this carbon, which has two hydrogens. And then that one's connected to this carbon, which has two hydrogens which is connected to this end carbon here, which has three. So this is called the condensed formula. This is the way that I have condensed down my structural formula without showing all, every single bond in the structure. I'm not showing all the bonds to my hydrogens. Um, that's implied, right? Each of my carbons is connected to each other. This carbon has three hydrogens. This one has two, this one has two, this one has three. That gives me this structure here. It's a little bit easier to handle than just looking at um, a gigantic molecule. But there's even an easier way to do that, and this has to do with the fact that um, oops, this has the has to do with the fact that each of my carbons, when it has single bonds, is tetrahedrally coordinated, right? So it's a four-sided pyramid. So if I actually drew this thing as if it looked in three dimensions, it would look something like this. Kind of bear with me here while I'm doing my artwork. Remember that our conventions here are that the large blocky triangle means that it's coming out at you. A dash triangle means that it's going back into the page. Coming out at you, going back into the page. And anything with a straight line is in line with the plane of the page or the plane of the board or the plane of the paper, etc. So the way that this thing actually looks when I have all of these tetrahedrons stuck together isn't a straight line. Even though we call them straight chain alkanes, this is still a straight chain alkane. This is the exact same molecule that I had up here. I'm just showing the three dimensional structure of it. But if I look at the backbone of the carbons here, just focusing on the carbons because it's organic, it looks like this. And this is another way that we can represent this molecule. It's called the skeletal diagram or I affectionately call them lightning bolt diagrams. They're also called backbone diagrams. Okay, so the lightning bolt diagram looks like this. Here's my butane, and that's it. So it's kind of a nice minimalist way of representing a molecule. The way that I'm looking at it here is at each point, if you, if you think about each of these as a carbon, then I have a carbon at each of my points. The lines that connect them are single lines. And um, the assumption then is that all of the carbons here have as many hydrogens around them as possible. So um, this gives us a way, um, three different ways to represent molecules. So let's go through and do another example here. <coughs> If I give you something that looks like this, and I said, well, what's the name of that thing? <laughs> You're like, well, it looks like a lightning bolt. Well, then I need to figure out um, how this relates to my organic molecules. So um, I'm counting my number of carbons. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, one at each of my points here, which means that my prefix is what? Think about it for a second. Six carbons, that's hex. And I have all single bonds that are between my carbons, so that means that it's an alkane. So this is hexane. Okay. Now what that actually represents is this molecule, CH3, CH2, 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 CH3. I have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons and all of the associated hydrogens. And so that gives me hexane. That's the condensed formula for hexane. Okay, so that's another way that I could represent it. 
Now when we start to get into alkenes and alkynes, then it gets a little more complicated. So if I was to do a skeletal diagram that looks like this, and then I put this right here, say. All right, now I'm showing you one that has a double bond in it. I represent the double bond with two lines instead of a single line. And so if I wanted to figure out the name of this thing, then I'd need to go, okay, well there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. So I know that my prefix for this is oct, and I have at least one double bond in this thing, so it's octene. Now, the other piece of this apart from just knowing that this is octene, the other part of this is where this double bond is located. And we need to locate the double bond um, by counting the carbons and by numbering these carbons. Now there's two different ways that I can number them. I can number them from left to right. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the way that you number a double bond is you number it based off of the number that it comes, that it starts on, if you wanna think about it that way. So if I'm numbering from one to eight here, in this case, it would start at my six. So that would say six octene. Now the problem with that is that we like to have the lowest numbers possible in organic chemistry. So um, if I was to number it the other way around, then it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, and now my double bond is at the second carbon, right? And I'm numbering each of my points because that's where my carbons are, and this is where the double bond starts at two. And so my choices are it's either two octene or six octene, and the lowest number always wins. And so that's the name of this thing based on where that double bond is, two octene, okay? All right, so let's look at another one. If I was to just give you something like this, Right? Again, it just looks like a weird symbol, but we're talking about it in the context of organic chemistry. And so now I say, all right, well, this is one, two, three. So I have three carbons. So that means that it's prop. It's got at least one double bond in it. So it's propene. And now it looks like I can number them either way. One, two, three, or one, two, three. So this is either going to be two propene or one propene. So which is it gonna be? Remember that lowest numbers rule, and so it's gonna be one propene, and we'll number it using my red numbers this time. So I use the black numbers up here because it gave me the lowest number for my double bond. I use the red numbers here because it gave me the lowest number for my double bond, okay? <coughs> so these are some examples of how to use the um, the skeletal diagrams or the backbone diagrams or the lightning bolt diagrams, that's what I like to call them, and to kind of relate them back to what we know about our, um, our condensed formulas and then relate those back to what we've seen with our Lewis dot structures or structural formulas. So these are just different ways to represent organic molecules, our simplest of the hydrocarbons, and I'll get into some more details about the chemistry that they could do um, in our next video. So if you have any questions on this, as always, don't hesitate to contact me and I'll talk to you guys again soon.